All right, welcome to my nine month update learning Latin. Today, I'm gonna to talk about all the good stuff I've read this month, my progress, and anything else I think is interesting to talk about. So let's get right to it. In terms of how many words I've read total, I'm up to 531,000 words, which I think that's like 100,000 words I read in the last month, maybe a little less. I didn't actually check what my, my number was from last month, but I got the volume this month, that's for sure. You can definitely feel it. When you get a lot of volume in over a sustained period of time, you definitely feel like you launch forward a little bit in terms of your ability. But the downside to that is that you also get that feeling where you get a little bit better and then you realize how much more you have to get better to be actually good. So the, the classic up and down Dunning-Kruger effect feeling where you feel good, you feel like you're awesome, and then you get a little bit better. Now you feel bad once again about your ability. And I definitely went through that a couple times this month, but that's just what happens, unfortunately, that as we get better, we feel worse sometimes until we get a little bit more better and then we feel better again until we get worse again. But that's just the way it rolls. And it's funny how quickly you take for granted your ability. Whereas nine months ago, I literally could not read a single word of Latin and now I can read some Latin. I'm not great at it yet, but I'm getting there. All right, so like I said before, or let's get right to it. What specifically did I read? So number one, I finished the first seven chapters of Roma, uh, Roma Eterna, which was the suggested stopping point before getting to the more difficult, challenging selections, specifically the Livy stuff and, and others. And the idea is that stop there just when things are starting to become less adapted and then build myself up in terms of my reading ability. And the last couple of chapters, like, 41 and 42. I mean, they were tough. I mean, I wouldn't say they were insurmountable. I definitely read them, understood them, enjoyed them, but it took some time. It was, I don't rem I didn't write any specific notes about them, but I got through them okay. Definitely the Livy stuff was slower going than the Aeneid stuff, but that's what I expected. Other than that, I don't have much to say about it, I guess, other than I thought it seemed to go fine. Um, I probably could have brute forced, I guess, my way through the rest of the book is my guess, but there's no real reason to. As long as I keep on reading Latin, I'll get better and better and better. And then I'll come back when I'm at a slightly higher level so that it'll be a relative breeze to get through the rest of the book at least hope that's the plan hopefully anyway so i finished that so that was 14,500 words so that was cool and then i went and read the four gospels of the bible of the new testament and this was interesting for a variety of reasons number one i wanted to see what was it like how is the bible of latin versus the caesar livy cicero style writing that a lot of the readers are sort of targeting. And I was also curious how different precisely is the Noah Vulgata versus the Clementine Vulgate? Just out of curiosity, like, you know, I had, there's so much controversy sometimes around the different editions. So I wanted to, I was curious how, how truly different was it, at least in terms of the Gospels. I know St. Jerome wrote the Gospels and I believe he had, from what I read, help from other scholars for the other parts of the New Testament. I believe he did all the Old Testament though, but don't quote me on any of that. I've just done a tiny little bit of background reading just out of curiosity. But yeah, and also I guess I also was curious, what would the experience of reading it be like if you have never actually read the Bible in English or in your native language? And especially if you're not a Christian, and I'm not a Christian, so I was like, what would this even be like? And so what did I write from my notes? Overall, I say a pretty enjoyable experience. This is at least talking about the book of Matthew. I'm not personally a Christian, but it was a great to read. Definitely a bit of a learning curve at the beginning. The Sermon on the Mount took me forever to get through. The style isn't exactly difficult, but there was a bit of a learning curve, plus a decent number of new words I had never seen before. The first few chapters took over 40 minutes to read, but by the end I could read a chapter in about 15 minutes. And depending on the length of the chapter, it was more like 10 to 15 minutes. If it was like 30, I don't know what they're called, sections, I guess, in each, in each book, or I guess, each chapter. So each chapter is like numbers. And I'm assuming those are like, you know, when you say like John 3, 17, what is that 17? I'm assuming a line uh, or, or section. I'm not sure. Each one of those sections, they, I mean, sometimes they would have like 40 sections, I guess, or sometimes even more, 70. Uh, sometimes they'd be relatively short, just like 30. Yeah. Once, once I got closer to the end of these four gospels, 
I was averaging somewhere between 10 to 15 minutes per chapter, about four or five chapters, books, I forget what they're called, but like John 1, 2, 3, and 4 would be like an hour's worth of reading. Yeah, in terms of the style, that was interesting because the the word order and just the specific, the specific word order and syntax is very different than other stuff that I read. And specifically the fact that they would often have the verb first and then the subject right after the verb which is not something you see very often. I'm sure it comes up, but it's not something you see as often like that. I, I had never, let me put it this way, I'd never seen it much like that in the stuff I had read before in Latin. You know, usually the verb is the end, although obviously not always. But the idea of having the verb first and then the subject, obviously you can, like, because of the endings and stuff, you can tell what's going on in the sentence, but it did take me a while to get used to it, like just to notice that pattern, just be able to fluently read it and, and not get kind of slightly tripped up on it. I, I'm assuming, I'm pretty sure it's based on the word order of ancient Greek or the Koine Greek of the New Testament, and that's why it is that word order. I'm curious what the Old Testament is like to read, if there's like a slightly, I won't say wonky word order, but like it feels different than the word order of the tip, the prose I'd read before. Because from what I, uh, I'm fairly sure the Old Testament was translated based on the ancient, the biblical Hebrew as opposed to Greek. And I'm not sure what word order is like in ancient, in, cl in classical Hebrew or biblical Hebrew, or is it even, I actually don't know to what extent it's similar to Latin in terms of cases and stuff. I'm assuming sort of, but I, I have no idea. But yeah, so in terms of style, it's not that any individual sentence was hard because the, the, the grammar and the idiom and stuff I don't think any individual sentence is hard, but getting to the point of being able to fluently read through it, uh, it was definitely like, again, I wouldn't say it was a, a struggle exactly, but you know, I was working through it. Like I was growing a lot. I was learning a lot about reading and I was learning a lot reading the Bible. I was, I was learning a lot reading these four gospels because you know, it, it takes a lot of reading to be able to transition from just, oh, I can understand the sentence to, read sentence after sentence consistently in a fluid way without stopping too much. And getting to that point is, you know, I wasn't, I'm not quite there yet. Like I was, there was good chunks of the, of these different gospels that I could read just fluently. I could just read through it. Um, but there was other parts that definitely I had to check the, the interlinear translation. And, uh, and I actually had basically on my computer, I had a PDF of the Vulgate on the left side and the other side was the interlinear translation because I don't really like reading the interlinear translation just through like that. I, I prefer to just read the just the Latin and then when I need to look over at the interlinear translation rather than like covering it up or something. I find that annoying. I'd rather only look at the interlinear translation if I actually need it. And that just kind of forces me to stick in the Latin. And by the end, if I could understand the sentence, even if there was like a slight fuzziness to it, I tried to resist the urge of always checking the English for my understanding because I think that, I don't think it's like that detrimental, but I try my best to stick with the Latin as much as possible. I think that's probably a good skill to practice. But yeah, so how, how difficult was it overall? I found it a challenge, but it was a good challenge. And again, it was a challenge because of the, the word order and it's just the style is different than what I've read before. I would say there was vocabulary that quite a bit of vocabulary I didn't know. I probably made about 150, 200 flashcards for the four gospels. So there was that. And I would also say that sometimes because I'm not Christian, sometimes I'm not actually sure what they were, what the Bible was, what Jesus was expressing, for example. That from my perspective, it almost felt like I was reading riddles and I would read the Latin and I'm like, I'm kind of confused what they're talking about. I'd read the interlinear translation, the it would have the Dewey Rames version. And I would read that and I'm like, well, so it doesn't really make any sense. And I would check the new international version. It seemed like a, a relatively modern language version of the Bible. It seemed seemed good good enough, I guess. And I would still not understand it. So I'm like, clearly I would need to go to some kind of Bible study to understand these these lines, which which makes me all of a sudden realize why Bible study is a thing, because some of these lines require study and contemplation and instruction and and all that stuff to really to get them. At least that's my impression. So uh, if if I was confused by a line because of the the message, you know, I, I try not to worry about it too much. But but that was that was tricky just because sometimes it was a little cryptic, and sometimes. But again, overall though, in terms of like enjoyment, I would say I enjoyed it quite a lot. I I really really did enjoy it. 
Uh, I never got tired of all those scenes where there were people who would doubt Jesus and then he would do something awesome and then their like minds would be, would be blown and then and then they would believe him and worship him. Like they did that so many times in the gospels. There's so many of those 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 scenes and I never got tired of it. I always found it very enjoyable. And there was I also enjoyed the parables actually surprisingly like Initially, not so much, but as it went on, especially, I was like, oh, this is, this is actually interesting. This forces me to think and contemplate and, and reflect on it, which I guess is the whole point. You know, he talks about for those who, uh, they talk about people who can see but can't see, for example, like people like he talks in parables as a way to, to get people to understand his word, etc. So uh, I, a lot of the parables I thought were, were, were quite interesting. The one about uh, plant like seeds falling in the in ground that there was not enough soil so that it grows but then it doesn't grow properly and you know seeds falling where there's thorns and stuff so etc like talking about different people and how they respond to the word and stuff yeah overall I, I found it quite compelling you know even moving at times there was also i think one of the my, my favorite parts i'm not sure where which one i'm referring to specific anyways i there was the one that story that i found compelling it was about jesus predicted that i think goes to Peter that he would deny Jesus three times and then the rooster would crow or a rooster would make a sound and you know we predicted it and then later when Jesus is, in, is like in front of the Jewish leaders you know Peter's in the crowd and watching and someone recognizes him and he's like aren't you one of his disciples and he's like no 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 and then a couple other people ask him and he's like no and he still denies it two more times and then you hear the the rooster crow and you're like it came true the, the prophet the the prediction did and Peter reflected on his uh, lack of, you know, faith with Jesus and stuff. I don't know. I found it very compelling. I found it very, very engaging. I'll admit, though, there was sometimes, like, the re repetition, while good for language acquisition, it did start to get a little much, you know, that there's only so many times I can read the exact same parables and the exact same ideas many, many times. But, again, it was helpful for, for the repetition, and every gospel had a slightly different flavor to it. So it wasn't exactly the same, but it started to wear, wear on me just a little bit by the end. I was, I was thankful to be done because there's only so many times I can read them. You know, if, if I was Christian, then obviously I would get more out of it because the whole point is to read it again and again and reflect. And, you know, anyways, yeah, long story short, I very much enjoyed it. Would everyone enjoy it? I don't know. I have the patience for it. I have the patience and interest and just in terms of historical interest and cultural interest. Like, it was very thrilling to see some of those lines that had permeated through, like, the cultural osmosis into my brain. Like, it's harder for a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle compared to a rich man entering heaven, for example. Like, that famous line shows up, I think, three times in the different Gospels. And that was thrilling to see. Or let thee without sin cast the first stone, for example. I was like, oh, I recognize that, etc. And so that was thrilling to see those, like, to have all of a sudden those, like, cultural references I finally actually see in the original or translation of the original at least I don't know if most people would be would be have the patience to sit to read through all four gospels um, the main reason I wanted to read them is that because I want to read medieval Latin I feel like those might be important to read at least the gospels I'm sure reading the Old Testament and the rest of the New Testament would be also beneficial and I feel like if you were a Christian I would definitely read the rest of the Bible because at least if your level is roughly where mine is, I think it was a very good level because I feel like I can read it relatively quickly, especially with an interlinear translation, which we have available. And if you're personally compelled and inspired by it, it's like the best reading material ever. Again, it's very, it's very a little different than obviously the style of classical Latin, but it's not that different. And it's all the same grammar and vocabulary and stuff. Again, slightly different, of course, you know. It, it's much, much closer than it is the same. And it just grows your understanding of the language. In the same way, like, if you're learning Spanish, you know, you can learn European Spanish and Mexican Spanish or Colombian Spanish or Cuban Spanish. And they're slightly different, but it's all clearly the same language. So it just, you shouldn't hold yourself back. You know, sometimes I feel, people feel like if it's not classical Latin, there's no point of reading it. But it's all Latin. It's just different. And it will only grow your understanding of the language, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, so there's that. That's um, pretty much it in terms of what I read. I just finished uh, Roma Aeterna up to 42, and then the four Gospels. So I do not plan to read any more of the Vulgate in the near future. 
maybe ever. I don't know. Uh, it's, I can see it happening, I guess. But maybe when I'm so good at Latin that it'll be it'll be truly easy reading and I can just read through it. I might conceivably see myself doing that, but not in the near future. Definitely not. Um, I think I, I got my fill of the Bible and I feel I feel enriched. I feel like I grew both in Latin and, and cultural awareness and understanding. It was a good experience, but I'm ready to move on. So what's up next? Next is I need to, I'm going to be starting a primer of medieval Latin by Beeson, which is an anthology of, I think it's relatively graded, so it starts with easier selections and moves forward, of various medieval Latin. And it has notes about some of the differences, but I'm not stressed too much about that kind of thing, because I'm, I'm assuming immersion will take care of most of my observations about what these words mean, like, uh, so, or the specific constructions. My, my guess is that just through immersion, just through reading a lot, most of the stuff I'll pick up the differences, and if I have to look it up, I'll look it up, and I'm sure I'll be fine. Um, so I'm excited about that, because the stories are from a variety of different genres and time periods, and so I'm, I'm excited for the variety because, you know, again, as much as I enjoyed reading the Bible, variety is not what it was. Um, oh, I, one thing I should mention, though, it, it is like, what was my favorite gospel? I definitely like Luke the best. One thing I learned, again, is that Mark was this, like came first in chronological order and then probably Matthew and then Luke and that Matthew and Luke are loosely based, not loosely based, based on Mark along with other texts. But it felt like Mark was the most stripped down version of the story of those three stories. And then Matthew was the same thing, basically, but just with more elaborations. There was a Sermon on the Mount and other things like that. And then Luke felt more like, felt almost more like a novel. It felt more like a bigger story that it was telling and taking its time to introduce the characters. It just felt like a richer, fuller experience as opposed to Mark, which is good. Just, again, a very stripped down version of the same stories. Uh, it's not that I didn't like John, but I found Luke the most compelling, the most interesting from like a literary standpoint. And in the Bible, of course, it, Matthew comes first and then Mark, Luke and John. From what I understand, the reason was that historically it was assumed that Matthew was the first in chronological order when it was first written. But scholars, I think are generally under agreement that in agreement that Mark came first. And so I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in that order. I would probably might suggest reading Mark first, just because it is the most stripped down. It's the shortest. It's the easiest, in my opinion. And so by doing it that way, it's like Mark is the easiest. You get the story, all the, the basic version of it. And then Matthew, which is basically the same thing, just a little more elaborations and other additions here and there. Um, and then and then Luke, which is just a step up from that. So it feels like a more graded experience. Go to Mark and then Matthew and then Luke. But I don't think it matters that much. Matthew, Mark, and Luke was just fine. I just noticed that when I, after I got through Matthew, when I went to Mark, it was super easy. I read it extremely quickly, like three days, something like that, two or three days. So it might make more sense in a graded sense to start with Mark and then Matthew, then Luke, and then John. But especially if you've read it though, if you, if you already read it in English, then it probably doesn't actually matter that much because the level is relatively the same throughout. Oh, and lastly, uh, the, the Nova Vulgata, Nova Vulgata versus the Clementine Vulgata. Uh, what was my experience? Because I had the actual PDF on my left side of my computer was actually the Nova Vulgata, which if you don't know, that was the, the new edition of Jerome's text after Vatican II. I'm not going to go into the politics of that. And then there's the Clementine version, which I guess was last, it was like the 1500s, I believe it came out. In reality, there are 99, I would say 99.5% to 99.9% .9 exactly the same. Like almost no difference. Like most, even like, like I think back, like were there even that any differences in John? I, I don't even remember any. Like it's like extremely small differences. Like it's implied on Wikipedia that it's like a reversion of it or a retranslation almost of the original text, but that's not at all. It, it's exactly word for word the same as the Clementine version with a few changes here and there. A couple word changes once in a while, every thousand words, there might be a word swapped out or something else. Plan for next month is to read a primer of medieval Latin. It's 83,000 words, which is pretty long. You know, uh, I think I should might be able to finish it in the month, maybe, and then go on to the next one, which is Medieval Latin by Harrington, which is another anthology. Again, to give kind of an overview of medieval Latin, and just kind of see the different stuff that's out there and find out which authors I like, which I dislike, and hopefully it will be a good read. And I'll report back in terms of, you know, the quality of those texts. But again, I wonder if like, you know, part of the point of these videos is to talk about my experience and that someone can come after me and perhaps model it or like use a similar strategy or fine tune it or make it better. 
And I just wonder if would most people who are non-Christians actually be able to sit through the four Gospels? I suspect probably not. So hypothetically, if you just can't stand reading the Gospels, just skip ahead to medieval Latin, I guess. But I would say at least read Mark. Just read Mark. It's not that long. It's a basic Jesus story, and it cover. You'll get used to, you know, maybe Mark and Matthew. Maybe you'll get you'll cover the the basics of the the specific style and stuff, and you'll have some of the, all the cultural references of of Jesus and other his main main ideas. So if you had to skimp, I guess just do Mark and Matthew, and then skip Luke and 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 John, I guess. But just suck it up and just read your Bible. Like it's, it's not that long. It's forty. What is it? Uh, 50,000 words? It's a good amount of reading. It'll help you read, even if you're not super motivated by the Bible. All right, let's talk about my updated version of my optimized Latin reading list because my other, this, this spreadsheet is a whole mess now because it's it's what I'm actually reading, but it, it's, it's a huge mess and disorganized and stuff. So the whole thing with the optimized list is just a lot more organized, a lot more clean and and nice to read, hypothetically. It's not that, it's kind of ugly, I guess, but. So I did update things, I did change things around. So one thing I added to my spreadsheet is sources for the text and the audio, because in a perfect world, we would be reading all these things and be listening to them when we're not reading. And the more you read, the more you listen, the more you read, the more you listen, the better and better you're gonna get at Latin. And so ideally we would have audio for good quality audio with good vowels, good, consonants, good vowel length, or and good elision and stuff like that, we would have that stuff. Turns out there is very, very little good audio out there. Like it is shocking how little there is out there. Like thank thank goodness for Luke Ranieri and Daniel Pedersen. Like if those people, if those souls were not around making Latin content, like the the state of, of Latin audio would be would be dire. It would be very dire. So it's it's amazing that their contribution to Latin pedagogy. Just I basically tried to find the audio and the text for all these this stuff. Now I'm not going to help people pirate stuff. Pretty much anything on this list you can find for free one way or another, except for maybe the Legantibus stuff. You know, it's not that hard to find the free versions of any of these texts, even though right now I list just the the Amazon link, for example. But I'm not gonna actively encourage piracy. You, you can make that choice yourself. You definitely do not have to pay for pretty much anything on this list. You know, if you uh, look in the right places. So just put it that way. Um, and then for the audio, I just found the, the best version of the audio of the, the text. So obviously Ruccaneri's is probably the gold standard for Familia Romana, although Daniel Pedersen's is also very good. My, I'm not an expert, obviously, on Latin phonology and pronunciation, but my impression is that they're they're kind of they're both good in their own ways, Luke Ranieri and Daniel Pedersen. And Luke Ranieri, my impression is his goal is as natural and as authentic as possible. Like this is how people would actually sound if they were reading a text out loud. Whereas Daniel Pedersen's pronunciation is more optimized for comprehensibility and for for teaching, so that students can understand it. And that's why he, he doesn't really do that much elision from what I remember. It's been a while since I've listened to it, so maybe that's wrong. And he pronounces, I believe, like the final M's in words when there's that, which is obviously not super authentic. But again, his point is that it's more about comprehensibility and it makes it easier for students to understand, which is fair enough. So I think they're just kind of slightly different philosophies. But obviously, like if everyone sounded like Daniel Pedersen, every single Latin teacher in America, for example, I think people would be doing pretty well. But my impression is they're kind of like the two gold standards and they are heavily represented in this list. So Familia Romana, of course, and Colloquia Personarum would be Lucrinaries, but again, Daniel Pedersen has his own version in Legantibus. There is not really a full recording of Babylai Latina, which is unfortunate. Someone did have a playlist. Yeah. Oh, no, it was right. Someone did the first 38, 31 stories of Babylai Latina, which I think is he's someone on the Discord, actually, the LLPSI Discord, which is cool. It sounds pretty good, but it's not complete, unfortunately, and it's not the greatest sound quality either, but it's something. Um, and then the YouTube stuff, obviously, is just on YouTube. Now, unfortunately, again, there's kind of a, a technological gap sometimes with people because I don't think everyone knows exactly how to rip audio off of YouTube. Like, it's very easy to do if you know what you're doing, but I'm not sure if there's like easy tools to do it for people who can't use a, a terminal, for example, or a command line program. And ideally, someone would have all these like in a file that people could just download and use. The The very beginning stuff actually is pretty robust, other than Fabula Latina, that would be like the main gap i would say like getting that recorded properly i think is the first priority in my opinion of the latin learning community 
But the rest of Familia Romana is fine. Obviously, Lucanari and Duke De Daniel Patterson has that covered. Obviously, all the Legentipu stuff has great audio as well. Now, I did make some alterations. Now, this is this is one novella that is highly recommended by people in Discord. I haven't actually read it yet, so I'm slightly theorycrafting here, but I heard a lot of people recommend it, and it's called Weirdo Ardens, which I'm not entirely sure what it's about, but... It is one of the most highly recommended uh, novellas out there. Ten bucks, I think. 16,000 words, which is a lot for a novella. Most novellas are way too short for how much they're charging, in my opinion. Very, not very many word unique words, so it fits really well in this reading list. And probably by the time you're at chapter 29 in Familia Romana, I don't think you probably have uh, too much uh, trouble with it. But it's just good extensive reading practice. But again, there's no audio for that, so... That's another priority that people need to, we need to get on. You know, I like to contribute at one point, but I'm not quite ready yet. But then again, most of this stuff is pretty good. Oops. Now, there's not really good audio for the Cambridge Latin course, unfortunately. It's like slightly questionable, like legally in terms of recording audio, like, because it's not actually, you don't have copyright of the contents. You can't just record it. You certainly can't sell it uh, for profit because it's not, you don't own the copyright. But I feel like very few companies are going to care if people are recording audio of these textbooks for people to listen to, especially if you don't have the actual text on the screen. It's my impression, but again, it's it's not actually like you don't have the rights to it. But there's one guy who recorded, I think, the first book. Yeah, I think it's the first book. The only downside, unfortunately, is that he like translates it as he goes. He'll say one line and then say the English. He'll say the Latin and then the English. So that's pretty annoying. I'm just putting the best version of the audio that we have. So that's another priority for re-recording. But I know not, not everyone is reading Cambridge Latin course, but I think that would be something, a priority for recording audio. Um, there's a couple of free novellas here, Sisyphus and Cloelia, Puella Romana, which needs to be recorded. Fables of Orbilius is actually in Legentibus. So we got that. Julia is, I think it is, oh, Latinum, Latinum has a recording of it so you'd have to pay $15 to download it I don't know if it's worth the $15 I'm not good enough to determine the quality of his pronunciation it seemed pretty good like it seems fine it's certainly not up to Lucrinari or Daniel Pedersen in my opinion or at least from my ear but it's like decent enough but is it worth the $15 just to get Julia and Carolus Caro at the Maria and like a couple of the other ones I guess you can get Adalpes too if you wanted I don't know if it's worth the price but it's the best we got at least from those so potentially could be re-recorded -re recorded um but it's hard to say and then chapter 35 i think actually has a recording in legente but i'm not sure i'd have to double check that so we actually do have the audio um so yeah so obviously the first two stages in terms of audio i would say is pretty good again other than fabulae latinae and a couple three of those novellas and the cambridge latin course so um as a community i would say those are pretty high priority in terms of getting them recorded because if if you're good at Latin, it's not hard to read, I don't think, the Cambridge Latin course and just you know, pound that out and get that, get that audio out there. Because again, the idea here is if we can read the text, once you've read it once, you would put it on your phone, the audio, and listen to that either when you're doing other things or just dedicated time to listen to the audio. And that will reinforce, that'll get the the, the actual sounds of Latin in your ear and that's going to make it easier and e you'll, you'll internalize more and more of the language and you'll progress much faster because you're doing reading and listening. And you can also obviously listen and read at the same time if you want but again I think that the power is that you know when you're on your commute or doing dishes or walking your dog you're listening to Latin all the time and that's just going to reinforce it and as you read each one of these selections you essentially add it to your playlist or add it to your circulation of things you're listening to so at the beginning you'd probably just be listening to Lucrinari's Familia Romana and Colloquia Personarum but as you read more and more and you subscribe to Legentu Boost pay your 10 bucks a month Daniel Pedersen you're gonna get more and more of this content that you're gonna be cycling through and you're gonna get more and more of this reinforcement and that to me is what 21st century Latin learning would look like, reading and listening. So that's why I think like that would be, those things would be, that I mentioned would be a priority to get recorded. Now, I also didn't really add much in terms of stage three, but as you can see, it's a little bit skimpy in terms of good audio. Uh, Latin by the Natural Method, the book one, I think it's an excellent book, but it doesn't really have complete audio. I think someone did, someone did like the first, I think four chapters of the whole book, but only like 17 minutes. So it's a 30,000 word book 
book. So that should be, oh, I don't know, two or three hours at least of audio. So maybe more, five hours. But it would be a lot of audio and be great because it's like easy, but it progressively gets more difficult and it's a variety of stories. Only challenge is that it's not, they don't mark the long vowels. So someone would have to either be know really Latin really well without having to refer to those or just go through it as and mark them up, I guess. But I think it would be a very good thing to get recorded at one point. Ecchero Romani, Oxford Latin Course 1 and 2. I think they're great books to read just as extensive reading, but I don't think there's any audio out there. Someone had the, I think it was actually the Cambridge Latin Course. I was like, oh, they, they, they recorded the audio for this book. This is excellent. I think every chapter. And then it was like full American accent. I'm just like, oh no, <laughs> this is no good. I mean, it's better than nothing, I guess, but uh, I just couldn't do it. Just couldn't do it. Um, but yeah, so a lot of these early stuff, first Latin reader, Latin for beginners, and Latin for today and stuff don't have any recordings. Septimus would be a very fun one to read. I wouldn't mind doing that at one point, but someone should do it. I added the text to Fabula. And then the rest of these, the, the later, uh, like the high quality intermediate uh, readers all have recordings either with Lucanary or Legentibus. But then once we get past the intermediate readers, it kind of falls off a cliff. Like, I don't think there's any recordings in uh, restored classical pronunciation of the four Gospels whatsoever. I don't think there's anything in terms of the primary medieval Latin or and all this stuff. Like it's like it is really dire when it comes to these these audio uh, like the the audio available. Again, thank goodness for Lucanari and Daniel Pedersen for all this because without them, this list would be very bare in terms of good quality audio. Perhaps the next generation of lab learners will contribute to that and make it even better. So that again, in a perfect world, we have all these good resources all lined up. You just read through it. You listen to it. You just keep on doing that. Get that feedback loop going and you'll progress way faster than I would have, than I have, just because you'll have everything organized for you. Now, another thing I reorganized was stage four. So I Actually, I, I kind of re renamed things. So uh, I, I didn't. I, I kept stage one and stage two by themselves, but I, re I relabeled stage three beginner and, and intermediate readers, which goes all the way up to Roma Aeterna. It's intermediate readers, basically. I mean, beginning, beginner and intermediate, all kind of leading up to more authentic content. And then stage four is, I, I separated it out now. I, the original plan was to have kind of a mixture. I would do like a little bit of medieval Latin, a little bit of easy classical Latin, and kind of bounce around like that. But I feel like it makes more sense to just focus on late Latin, medieval Latin, and neo Latin before just moving and focusing on classical Latin. Obviously, you know, it might be kind of boring, like maybe you're like really jazzed about classical Latin and you want to mix more classical Latin in, and you could obviously do that if you want. This is not any, you don't have to do it in this order, but I think there's a real benefit in organizing it in that way to stick with like these time periods. And in general, my guess is the medieval and neo-Latin and late Latin would be easier than the classical Latin. So why not just build your skills up with late medieval and neo-Latin? Like it just makes logical sense. But we'll see. Again, it's theory crafting, so it's possible that maybe this is not the great way to go. You know, it's kind of a nice way to kind of get an overview of what Latin is out there. Of course, I have the four Gospels, which I just did. Moving on to Beeson's Primer of Medieval Latin, and then Harrington's Medieval Latin Anthology. There's also Millenn Millennium a Latin Reader, which is sort of covering similar time periods as the other ones, but I guess with late Latin added as well. Um, I'm not sure if I'll read that one. Like, I put it in there, and I... Hopefully I'll read it. I think it seemed like an interesting selection of readings and stuff, and hopefully it's different than the other two, sufficiently different, but we'll, I guess we'll find out. And then I already talked about before some other late Latin um, and medieval Latin stuff. Uh, I, and then I added a few more things that probably that seemed interesting. They, they were all kind of like super popular medieval uh, Latin, like there was so many people read during that extremely popular in that time period. Historia Apolloni Regis Turi, which is kind of a, it's kind of like an extended version of a Gesta, Gesta Romanorum story is what it's been described, kind of just one of those kind of stories. So it seemed kind of like an interesting idea. It didn't seem very hard. So why not throw it in there? And also uh, Legenda Aurea, which is the Golden Legends, another extremely popular collection of medieval Latin stories. This one, um, Historia Regum Britanniae. Again, it didn't seem very hard from the part that I, 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 I perused, and it seemed interesting. And there's also a real benefit to having a, a sustained long amount of, like novel length, 52,000 words, novel length of text by the same person, that there's a real benefit to just sticking with that one author and you'll grow a lot over the course of that novel or that 
the collection. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Maybe I and I'm not recommending, but and also like uh, Gesta Francorum, which is another long one, which has been recommended, is even relatively accessible and extremely popular. So we'll see. Again, maybe this is too much. Or maybe I'll cut out some things, put it in now, and then I can refine things as I go along. And then people who come after me, of course, can refine it and make it better and make it much better than it is right now. And of course, I added some Neo Latin as well, just for funsies. Again, we'll see if I actually read them. But uh, Alice in Wonderland, Winnie the Pooh, Robinson Crusoe, Fairy Tales by Awel Lanus. I thought it'd be fun to read one of his stuff because he's kind of a famous Neo Latinist. And of course, Harry Potter. I wasn't originally going to read Harry Potter. But you know, again, extensive reading is extensive reading. I probably wouldn't like sentence mine it too much, but I already read those books several times. I read them in English, I read them in French, I've seen the movies, so I know the story pretty well. I could probably extensively read them. Uh, I probably I won't demonstrate it on camera right now, but I feel like by the time I get there, I read you know several hundred thousand more Latin. By the time I get to Harry Potter, Harius Potter, I'm, I'm sure it'll be fine. Well, that's the plan, hopefully. Finally, stage five, classical Latin. And I just kind of broke things up a little bit to Guineus Fabulae, of course, to start with. And then the 10 books of Eutropius, some other stuff. I threw Puer Romanus and Cicoronis Kiko, Fidius. I'm not sure if that's spelled right in here, just because I didn't read them before. I remember finding Puer Romanus very, very hard at the time. It's very possible it's way too, e it'll be too easy by the time I get to it. And so I'll have to adjust things in this list. It seemed like a good book that I wanted to read. It was just too hard at the time. And the same thing with Cicoronis uh, Filius. I wonder if that's misspelled. Uh, it also seemed compelling and interesting, so it can't hurt. And again, if it ends up being too easy, then I'll just shuffle things around. Paidrus, Gallic Wars, Nepos, and then the rest of Roma Aeterna. And so that's my rough plan right now. And again, I am sure I will refine things and change things as I go along. But again, the main change this month was changing the stages, their names a little bit, and adding, organizing things into late medieval Neo Latin as one stage, and then classical Latin as the second. Again, not to imply that classical Latin is more important or like the goal for everyone. And so hypothetically, if you don't actually care about classical Latin, then just like go from stage four, just go on and do whatever you want, because I'm sure at that point, you'll be good enough to read whatever you want, or at least can approach it. That's it. So again, the plan is just read through primer of medieval Latin, and then hopefully start at least Harrington's. That'll be good. And then so hopefully I'll be able to, again, finish all of stage four and get into stage five by the end of 12 months of the year. Let's see how much I get through because let's see anything else I could talk about toggle real quick. One thing, unfortunately, I would be way farther ahead if I didn't get sick for like a week. I didn't do anything for like a whole week. I, one thing I've learned about, my, about myself is that I do not like to do any language learning when I'm sick. I do not want to do that. It's, I don't find I'm very productive. I hate it. And so when I'm sick, I just drop it mostly. Uh, I even dropped Anki. I didn't really do any Anki and I had to catch up on that. So as you can see, a huge drop in terms of in week eight where I did only three hours in the whole week, which I guess is not that bad for like normies. Maybe like normies would say like three hours, like it's still a lot. I mean, it's not very much. Like if you're doing less than an hour of language learning, this I realize this might come across as kind of elitist or what, like as a bit of a try hard maybe. But if you're not doing at least an hour a day you're gonna your progress is gonna be extremely slow and like you like really like two hours honestly would be like ideal or three hours even like and it's not like you're sitting down there reading you know Cicero for three hours straight you might read an hour and then you might do Anki for 15 minutes then you might read listen to an hour and a half of easy audio throughout the day when you get, get up on your commute washing your, the dishes so I think most people can get two hours if you just fit it in I mean it may, it's a commitment but you know if you have an hour of solid reading time plus a little bit of flashcards and then audio throughout the day two hours is very achievable for most people I think you know I don't think everyone's that busy so my best week was 19 hours the whole week so that's two and a half hours every single day which is great and then I got sick which threw a wrench into everything and then now I'm recovering and back up to 14 hours I'm still amazed that my reading is so I've done 108 hours over the course of two months so that's again almost two hours per day which is I can I can bump those numbers up those are rookie numbers to quote Matthew McConaughey I'm surprised my listening is still only one third of my total time. Like when I was doing French, it was the opposite. I would do one one third reading, two thirds listening. But I got to bump up my listening, I guess. And 
but I have noticed my listening improving a lot, I would say. It's still like a long way to go, but when you listen for an hour or two a day, especially if it's audio, that it's relatively easy for your level, but you're still learning to parse it in real time, it, you, you'll improve pretty quickly. And especially if you're putting in one to two hours a day of it, again, somewhat passively or actively, you'll, you'll improve. So I would like to improve my listening time next month and do a lot more of that, but I can only do what I do. I'm just gonna keep on going on again. A nice, a very nice trend, right, of up, you know, first nine hours. And I, I love using Toggle. I, I find it very focusing. And I, I realize it sounds like torture for people to actually track how much they're studying, but I find it very, it kind of gamifies the experience. So I'm going to ride that. Gamification doesn't last forever. Eventually it's, it wears off its effect. So we'll, we'll, I'm going to ride that though as far as I can take it. Because right now I still find it very fun to press that button to know like, all right, time to read. Or it's like, press the button, time to listen. I guess I don't, I'm not adding Anki here. I don't know how much Anki time. Let's see. How much did I do last? 30 days for time. I don't know, I guess Anki doesn't display that statistic anymore exactly, at least on the, the desktop version. Let's check the phone version real quick. So in the last month I did 322 minutes, which is five hours. So we can add another 10 hours, I guess, to my Anki time here. But again, it's not significant compared to my reading and listening. And that's how it should be. You know, Anki is a great supplement, but it is not the pinnacle of your learning. It's not the most important thing. It's wonderful. In the same way, like grammar study, it's, it's useful, it helps, but it should not be the main focus of your learning. So yeah, so in terms of Anki though, Anki is going great. I have 1,266 cards and that's of course on top of the 1,500 I did from, from, from Familia Romana. So I guess 27, 2,800 uh, cards altogether. And my retention has been good, you know, approximately 87%, something like that, 86%, which is exactly where you want it to be. Not too high, wasting too much time, not too low, where you're getting too many leeches, so it seems to be going well there. Here, let's look at some of the, the latest cards I did. In when it out there, Jesus Asselum Serit Supereum. You know about Macron, so I'm doing my best. But Asselum uh, is a, a young donkey, apparently, which I probably could have inferred from the endings and stuff, but I did not. So again, this this word, Cuida en imputaba quia loculo sabe baturas. There's another example of the verb person and the subject, meaning purse. The, the word seems somewhat familiar, so I don't know if I learned it before and then forgot it or something. But again, will those words be useful in the future? Who knows? But it doesn't take that long to make an Anki card. Okay, so. I think that's pretty much it that I wanted to talk about. So again, I'm just going to keep on carrying on. If someone has any suggestions for for turning the and adding to the Latin reading list, let me know. I am open to any suggestions to change it and feel free to download it and copy it and make it your own, fool around with it. It's up to you. It's why I made it for people to use it. But yeah, next month, hopefully I'll be well into medieval Latin, which I'm excited about because there'll be some cool stories and I'll report back and hopefully my listening comprehension will be better as well. All right, wale, walete. Well, now I gotta get better at Latin. <laughs>